This morning we are going to continue our Lord's teaching on rest, namely the rest that the Lord Himself provides. We're building on our text last week where Jesus is addressing uh, those who are coming to Him, and those who are coming to Him are weighed down with various trials and burdens. He declares to them in Matthew eleven twenty eight, He says, Come to Me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And to the person who is struggling with the guilt and the shame of sin, to the one who is burdened with grief or anxiety, or feels downcast or dejected, this is a tremendous comfort that the Lord God Himself provides us with rest. This is not a new concept. It really proceeds from the teaching in the Old Testament, way back in Genesis chapter 2 even, in the creation account, we read that after six days of work, the Lord God completed all of His creative work, and the Bible says that He rested on the seventh day. Now the question, the age-old question is, well, why did God need to rest? Was He tired? The answer is no, not at all. God never runs out of energy. He never is weary or sleepy or tired. He never needs to rest, but yet He takes this seventh day of rest in order to model for us, for humanity, that we also ought to rest. He does this for us. In fact, He even codifies this into law. Exodus chapter 20, Moses records what we know to be the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. And the fourth one is this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And then he explains this command, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. The word Sabbath really meaning a ceasing or a resting. You are to stop and rest at least one day in seven and then Exodus 20, verse 11, really roots this command in the creation account. This is very interesting. He says, For in six days the Lord has made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and then rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Again, God is commanding that we rest. Why? Why would God tell us to rest, to cease, to desist from working? Because it's good for us. It's good for us, and it's also appropriate that we might set aside the time to consecrate, to make holy a day to worship Him. That's why we gather here. Now, it's theologically speaking, this Sunday is not the Christian Sabbath, if you will. We don't observe a Sabbath in the Old Testament law sort of way. But on a principle, the early church on principle said, we're going to still set aside a day as practice for us to honor God and to worship Him, even though we as believers, we are to consecrate every day to worship God and to serve Him only. And so the Lord is giving these commands for us, and in doing so, He models that very command in Himself. He does it Himself to show us. But through the course of Jewish history, there has been opportunity for those to seize on the observance of the Sabbath as an opportunity for them not to rest, but for the purpose of legalism. And Jesus tackles this propensity for legalism head on in Matthew chapter 12. And so if you haven't already turned to Matthew 12, please do so. Matthew chapter 12. Now, after uttering really a harsh condemnation against the unrepentant cities of Galilee, and then he follows that immediately by these, the, the incredible comforts given to those who are following him, such a stark dichotomy between the two, blasting the unrepentant cities and then comforting those who are in need of comfort, Jesus then engages in the most intense interchange in the Gospel of Matthew thus far. Things really come to a head at this point and they're going to keep on intensifying. This is really the, the first step of the trajectory toward uh, intense persecution and opposition, but also an intense fortitude by the Lord Jesus Christ to press in up until the point where He gets to the cross. And it's over the issue of the Sabbath. The Sabbath becomes really the, the key point here. That was a key pinnacle feature for the Israelites, for the Jews. And as we're going to see, Jesus is going to tackle this head on. And it's, he's, he's going to tell us it's about far more than just a day. Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath 
And his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions, how he entered the house of God, and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Departing from there, he went into their synagogue. A man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored to normal like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. We're covering a lot of territory today, but I think you're going to see that both of these, really there's two accounts that are happening here in this passage. They work together. They're really complementary. Matthew here records the events of Jesus and his disciples as they pass through these grain fields on their way to their next destination. Now, commentators have wondered where they were going, where they're coming from. We don't know any of that information. But we do know that they're traveling and sometimes they're able to follow normal roads and sometimes you have to make your own path. And so as they're making their own path through these grain fields, they're traveling and they're, they're grabbing heads of grain as we're going to see. But they're traveling on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, which is permitted by Jewish law, but only up to a certain distance. We could get into all that discussion. We surely will in other points uh, talk about, we'll talk about the Sabbath more as it comes up uh, in the future. But really, they're, they're traveling on the Sabbath, and it says here that at a certain point, the disciples, they became hungry. And so as they walked by, they, their hands were touching this grain, and so they would just grab a piece of grain, the standing grain that was in the field, and they would, they would roll the stalks in their hands, and they would just pick out the pieces they could eat, and they would eat the grain. And they would do this really just to satiate their appetite as they're traveling. Ever get to a point where you just have those hunger pains and you don't need a big, huge meal? You just need something to tide you over until you get to have a meal? That's probably what they're doing here. But look at verse 2. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, talking about Jesus, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath. Now, we don't know what the Pharisees were doing, spying on them, but somehow, as they're traveling through the grain fields, Pharisees are watching them do this. I'm assuming that no matter where Jesus went, there was always a spy for the Sanhedrin somewhere near him to report back all the things that he was doing. But they observe the the disciples breaking the Sabbath. And you might ask yourself, well, what's that to them? What does it matter if what people do on their day of rest Except that the Pharisees, they were the ultra-religious leaders in Israel. They were the gatekeepers of the law, if you will. They were the religious conservatives, and they made it their business to see to it that everybody in Israel was following not only the law of God, the Torah. More than that, though, they also, also wanted to make sure that everybody in Israel was observing the Jewish traditions that were taught in the Mishnah, which is the Jewish teaching on the law. And so observing some perceived wrongdoing, they go after Jesus about the conduct of his disciples. Now the question is, well, what law are they breaking? Which law are they breaking? Now one might be tempted to think that they're breaking the law by stealing grain from someone else's field because the fields don't belong to them, and so how dare you take grain from someone else's field? Except that the law actually permitted people to do this. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 25 It says that when you enter your neighbor's standing grain, then you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not wield a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. So you can pick if you're hungry, but you just can't harvest and take a bunch for yourself. Furthermore, Leviticus 19.9 commands farmers, actually commands the farmers, to leave the, the outer corners of their fields unharvested so that the poor 
and the sojourner can feed themselves. So it's actually commanded of the people who own these fields, look, leave, leave the edges for people who need it. That's important. And so they would do that. And so as friendly sojourners passing through, Jesus and the disciples, they were perfectly within their right, within the law, uh, to, to take some of the grain as they're passing by and to give themselves something to eat. And so you might ask, well, what's the crime? What's the crime? What did they do wrong? Just passing through, eating what they're allowed to, do, to eat? Well, according to the traditions and the teachings of the Pharisees, the disciples are guilty of working on the Sabbath. Working on the Sabbath. What's interesting about this is that despite the importance of Sabbath keeping in the Bible and the law, there are actually very few biblical instructions on how to keep it. Ever consider, when you read through your Bible, ever consider that? There's actually very little said about what you are allowed to do. He tells you what you're supposed to do to, to observe the Sabbath, to keep it holy, to worship the Lord, to not work, things like that. But in terms of the meticulous details of it, there's not much written. And so what do the Pharisees do? what the Pharisees always do. There's a need for a law, let's make five. So that's what they did. They're addicted to law keeping and so they felt justified to write their own laws on how the Sabbath is to be observed. In fact, in the Mishnah, again, the Jewish teaching on the law, the Mishnah, there's listed 39, the text literally says 40 minus one, 39 kinds of work that are forbidden on the Sabbath. This includes, and I checked, Sowing, plowing, reaping, gathering, threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, sifting, kneading, and baking. In addition to that, shearing, like you're shearing wool, whitening, combing, dyeing, spinning, stretching, constructing, weaving, splitting two threads, untying a knot, sewing two stitches together, or even tearing fabric in order to sew two stitches together. Trapping a deer, Slaughtering, flaying, salting, tanning, smoothing, writing two letters. I don't mean a whole letter, I mean an actual one letter. Writing a letter, or excuse me, writing two letters, erasing two letters, building a structure, dismantling a structure, extinguishing a fire, kindling a fire, hammering a nail, carrying an object from domain to domain, and there's more. And so if you were found doing any of these things on a Sabbath, you had to go and bring a sin offering to the temple and confess. But all of this was unbiblical and, frankly, not restful at all. In fact, all of you look stressed out having I just read that list. <laughs> Can you imagine trying to keep that? Honey, what, what are you doing? Are, are you weaving? Don't weave. Well, what are you doing? Oh, I don't know. Are, are you walking too far? In a, I mean, this is how extensive this law went. Every single thing you could have done, you had to double check. Okay, what did the Mishnah say? Oh my goodness, what are we doing? That's how stressful this was for them. And so their accusation essentially is that because they were plucking the heads of grain and rolling them on their fingers, they were breaking the Sabbath because they're guilty of reaping. They're reaping grain. You can't do that on the Sabbath. How does Jesus respond? I want you to notice this. Jesus could have could have responded the way that you and I probably would have, and he could have attacked their foolish, extra-biblical rules and said, that's not the Bible at all. How dare you make up rules like that? He doesn't do that. He actually bypasses that altogether, and he goes right to the Scriptures. Goes right to the Scriptures. Look at verses 3 and 4. But he said to them, have you not read? That's the most insulting question you could ask a Pharisee, by the way. Have you not read your Bible? Do you not know your Bible? They memorized the Bible from the time they were children. So he says this over and over again to them. Have you not read something in the Bible? And they would have, uh, get all bothered by that. And he says, have you not read that David did this when he became hungry, he and his companions, how he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who are with him, but for the priest alone. Jesus immediately appeals to a very well-known episode in Israel's history. In fact, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 21 in your Bible. 1 Samuel 21. The events of 1 Samuel 21 really take place when David is on the run from King Saul. Saul is trying to kill him. 
and he's fleeing for his life. He's find, finding sanctuary and hiding places all over the place and trying to, to, to keep himself concealed because if he knows he gets exposed, he's going to die. And so he's traveling around, him and a small band of men, and they find themselves in a desperate situation, and they find themselves in this place, the land of, of Nob, and they're, they're in need of food. They're hungry. And so we pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 21. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest, and Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? David said to Ahimelech, the priest, The king has commissioned me with a matter and has said to me, Let no one know anything about the matter in which I am sending you and with which you are, have, I have commissioned you and I have directed the young man to a certain place. Now, therefore, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. The priest answered David and said, There is no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread if only the young men have kept themselves from women. David answered the priest and said to him, Surely women have been kept from us, as previously when I set out and the vessels of the young men were holy, though it was an ordinary journey. How much more than today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him consecrated bread, for there was no bread but the bread of the presence, which was removed from before the Lord in order, to be, in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. Now, this priest, Ahimelech, he has no food to give David and to his men. He's totally out at the moment. The only edible thing for them was this show bread, or what is known as the bread of the presence. According to Levitical law, Leviticus 24, the priests are supposed to prepare uh, 12 loaves of bread. Now the 12 are signifying the 12 tribes of Israel. So they're, they're setting out these loaves of bread on the Sabbath. And when the old bread is, is done, they take that away and they're allowed to go and eat that bread. But they set out this new show bread in consecration to the Lord. It's an offering to the Lord. Again, only the priests are allowed to eat the bread that's been taken away. They can eat it. But yet when David arrives unannounced and hungry, and I would even add to this, and we can talk about this a different day, uh, under false pretense, he's running for his life, and so he's, he creates a false narrative in order to, to get himself in the door. But regardless of all that, he, not, he arrives unannounced and hungry, and the priests, they feed David and his men, they feed him the consecrated showbread that nobody in Israel is allowed to eat except for the priests. David's not a priest. Neither are his men. Well, why? Why did they do this? The, the priest said every right in the world to say, David, you know the rules. You know I can't give this to you. You know that's right. You're, I mean, but he doesn't do that. He, he knows that David, this future king of Israel, he knows that this man, this, this righteous man, is hungry. And so he violates the law in order to feed him. Was this okay to do? To violate God's law to feed David and his men? Jesus says yes. Jesus says yes. And so we see a principle, not of God breaking his own law, but of allowing a greater law to supersede it. Mercy toward those who are in need. Mercy. Mercy. God does this elsewhere. He actually does it quite a bit. He does it quite a bit. Think about the story even of Adam and Eve, where God promised them and commanded them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, if you eat on, uh, from this tree, the day that you eat of it, you're going to die. He threatens them with death, not just spiritual death. He, he threatens them with physical death. You eat from the tree today, you're going to die. And yet when they do it, what does he do? He could have acted on his law and killed them immediately. But he doesn't do it. He actually extends mercy he extends mercy. He grants an extension of life and even provides covering for them, for their bodies. Yes, they're still going to be punished with, with death in the future, but he redeems them and he actually extends their life. And Adam lives for a long time. See, the legalistic Pharisees, they would rather starve somebody to death than allow their Sabbath observance, observance to be ruined. But Jesus focuses on the greater need, the need of his people. But he's not done. Go back to Matthew 12. There's more going on here. After reasoning from the Scriptures regarding David, Jesus then turns to the practice of the priests. 
That's what David did. What about the priests? What are they supposed to be doing? And what he does essentially is showing mercy on the Sabbath is certainly permissible, but what about working? Let's just say that we're going to set aside the mercy principle for one second, because they could say to, to Jesus, well, that was an extenuating circumstance. I mean, that's David. What about this practice of working on the Sabbath? Is all work forbidden on the Sabbath? Look at verse 5. Jesus reasons this way. Have you not read in the law, again, insulting, have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath? Your priests in Israel, every single week, without fail, they break the Sabbath, on the Sabbath. And he says, and they do this and they're innocent. Well, how is this working? Here, Jesus doesn't reference really a specific verse, but he, he references a well-known truth. This is happening right underneath their noses because the priests are working on the Sabbath. What are they doing? Well, every single Sabbath, they have to knead the, the dough and, and cook the bread and prepare the bread and lift up the offering and make a sacrifice and do all of the, the rigors of, of the, the ritual of sacrifice on the Sabbath. And all the Sabbath worship is done through their hands. So they're not doing, Israel's not doing anything unless it comes through the ministry of the priests. So for the priests, the Sabbath day was the busiest day of the week. And yet, they are not considered guilty of violating the Sabbath. Why? Why? Well, because the temple service, the temple service is greater than Sabbath observance. And they couldn't disagree with it because it was true. Jesus is pointing out a reality that they partake in. They, they've been in temple. They live there. They know. And so they can't reason with them even from regular Jewish practice. He's not even dealing with the Mishnah, with the extended law. He's talking about about the Bible and about regular Jewish practice that has been sanctioned by the Lord. And so they are allowed, the priests are allowed to break the Sabbath in order to work and serve the Lord. But then Jesus lands a left hook. Look at verse 6. But I say to you that something greater than the, than the temple is here. Something greater than the temple. So we've already gone from temples greater than Sabbath, but now he's saying there's something greater than temple here right now. Now they would have had something in their mind that would have told them, okay, he's speaking out of, out of turn here. We don't like this. We don't know where he's going, but this is not good for us. Scholars have pondered the meaning of this verse for years, but it seems clear enough. This something greater is a veiled way to say someone greater. Someone greater. Remember back in John chapter 2 when Jesus ransacks the temple and, and turns tables over and casts out the money changers and the Jews, they come to him all frantic and they ask him, what sign do you show us seeing that you can do these things? And otherwise, what, what right do you have to do this? Who gives you the authority to ransack the temple? Who are you? And he answers, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. And they look at him like, what are you talking about? It took 46 years to build this temple. Are you mad? But we know that he's not talking about the physical temple. And John even tells us that in the text. He's not talking about the building. John is telling us that Jesus is referring to his own body. This temple. Destroy this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it. He's talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. So Jesus is, is referring to the temple of his own person, his own earthly dwelling place where God resides. Ever consider the fact that Jesus' temple, his physical corporeal body, that is the place where God resides and moves. It's the center of all religious life at the feet of Jesus. It's the pinnacle of sacrifice and worship. But in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, we have the very dwelling place of God in human flesh. Jesus is fully, truly God. And John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Literally, the Greek is tabernacled with us. Pitched His tent, His dwelling place with us. And then John says, And we have seen His glory. We've seen His glory. See, it's not ultimately about the temple, the building, 
Later on, at the end of, toward the end of Matthew's Gospel, the disciples are looking out over the, 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 the city, and they say, oh, look, Lord, look at all these beautiful buildings. Look at the temple. It's so lovely. And Jesus says, it's all coming down, my friends. It's all coming down, down to the last brick. The temple is temporary. No, again, true worship of God is done at the feet of Jesus, who is the true temple, the greater temple. And so we see the principles here of love and mercy and compassion over the law. We see temple over Sabbath. And now we even see Christ over temple. And Jesus is systematically dismantling Jewish religious system in front of their eyes. And there's nothing they can do to stop it. You see this? He's unraveling all of this in front of them. Happening in real time and they're reeling. They don't know what to do. But they should have known this. Look at verse 7. And if you had known what this means, again, this is the third time they get burned. If you knew this verse, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. If you knew that verse, friends, if you knew that I desire sac compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. If you understood, if you really understood the scriptures and the doctrine that is taught here, if you really understood the character and nature and loving kindness of God along with His justice and His mercy, but if you had really known God, you would not have condemned the innocent. Shame on you is what he's saying. He's quoting here from Hosea 6.6. 6. We've already seen this back in Matthew 9.13, but he brings it back around. Now what he's not saying, he's not saying that God doesn't care about sacrifice. He's not saying that God doesn't want sacrifice. Because remember, the sacrificial system exists in Israel because of God's command to do so. Even though we understand that that is all a shadow and a type pointing to the sacrifice of Christ, and certainly the Lord God cares about the sacrifice of Christ, without the sacrifice of Christ we have no forgiveness of sins. So it's not that God doesn't care about sacrifice. But if a choice must be made, on earth, right here, right now, if a choice must be made between compassion and mercy and love and sacrifice. It's compassion over sacrifice all day long. That's what he's teaching here. And why does he cite this here? Why does he bring this in right now? Because in their zeal for law, and their zeal for Sabbath observance and sacrifice, you have to give of yourself and do these things and offer these things. Because of their zeal in doing all of these things, they had invariably crushed the people and condemned the innocent and withheld true compassion. They lacked compassion. There was not a single molecule of compassion from the Pharisees to God's people. And at this point, we know from Mark chapter 2, Mark 2 and Luke also record this event, but Mark 2.27 adds this phrase that Jesus utters here he says this, in addition, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What does he mean? He means that the Lord God created and commanded a day of rest so that his beloved creation would have rest. He did not create a Sabbath observance for the purpose of enslaving people to it. God didn't give law and then create people and say, all right, do all these laws. It's, that's backwards order. The Pharisees completely misunderstood the purpose of the Sabbath. They totally botched it. For, for many Jews, this is supposed to be a time of joyous celebration and rest. I don't have to work today. And I don't have to feel guilty about it. The Lord wants me to rest and enjoy my family and worship Him freely and have rest for my body, and sing praises to Him, and glorify Him, and count my blessings. He wants me to honor Him and glorify Him today, at least today. But then Jesus lands this right hook, verse 8. He says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Oh boy. In this sentence, Jesus doesn't just claim to be greater than the Sabbath. He's already said he's greater than the temple in veiled language. He doesn't just say that something greater than the Sabbath is here. He asserts that he, the Son of Man, is Lord 
Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, he created the Sabbath for his people, and yet the Pharisees are trying to profane it. What he's essentially saying is, the Sabbath that you're so keen on keeping and enslaving people to, that's my Sabbath. That's my day that I made for you. You don't have the right to tell people what to do and add to my law when I'm offering them rest. The Son of Man is Lord, Lord of all rest. Now at this point, the Pharisees, they're not sure what to do. What do they do? What do they say? What do you say when someone is dismantling your entire life and ministry work? The system that you've become wealthy by. The power that you've inherited. The generational influence that you have because your father and your father's father were all temple priests. What do you do? Well, they don't know what to do. Jesus has made some pretty wild accusations and assumptions. So how are they going to expose him for the fraud that they think that he is? What's the plan? Well, they find their opportunity very soon. Look at verses 9 and 10. Departing from there, he, Jesus, went into their synagogue. And a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. This is not an earnest question, by the way, my friends. Because the writer of the Gospel says very plainly that there is an intention behind this question. According to Luke's Gospel, this event took place on another Sabbath. So it's possible that the Pharisees actually had to wait. They had to sit on all of this seething anger and rage. They had, to, they had to wait for opportunity. And that's what they did. They were plodding along, waiting for him to make what they perceived to be a mistake or something they could hang him on. But Jesus would have visited many synagogues. He would have done this weekly, week in and week out. And on this particular week, he goes and he, he enters into their synagogue and he encounters this man who's there who has a withered hand. Now, many believe that it's either a hand that never fully developed, or it's possible that it could be a hand that is withered and white from leprosy. We don't really know. But whatever is wrong, this hand is not working the way that it should. But when the Pharisees see this poor man with a withered hand, when they see this man, they don't look at him with pity or compassion. They don't look at him and say, oh, this poor guy. He's been coming in week in and week out praying for healing and just hasn't got it and... We feel bad for him. No, they look at this man with a withered hand, and they know what they see when they look at him? Opportunity. We're going to use this guy to get Jesus. It is sick. But that's what they do. It's a trap. They set a trap for him. And here's the trap. According to Jewish law, healing on the Sabbath is permitted. You could heal somebody on the Sabbath, but only if the ailment is life-threatening. If it's a life-threatening ailment, then you're allowed to heal. But here's the thing. A man with a withered hand, that's not life-threatening. He can live his life, and apart from just some inconvenience, if you will, he's okay. And so they begin to question Jesus, knowing they have the perfect trap set for him. They're going to use this man with a withered hand. They're going to use him to get Jesus. And so they ask Jesus, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And they're waiting. What is he going to say? What's he going to do? And here's how it goes. If he does... They're going to accuse him of breaking Sabbath law. But if he doesn't, they're going to accuse him of either lovelessness or impotence. You can't heal this man, so you don't have any power at all. No matter what Jesus says or does, this is a trap. But how does Jesus respond? Look at verse 11. And he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath... Will he not take hold of it and lift it out? This is common sense. Common sense. Even the Pharisees would have done this. See, nobody would have left a sheep in a pit all day long and let it suffer. That's inhumane. After all, we have to love the animals to the expense of loving people, don't we? Isn't that what today's culture will tell you? That lie has been propagated from the beginning. That somehow sheep are more important. But they would do it for a sheep... This poor guy's been coming to temple every single week with a withered hand. Nothing can be done for him. He's being used. That's okay. But if a sheep falls into a pit, all of them are, th are thinking in their hearts, well, of course I'd lift that thing out. And they would have. That was the whole point. 
And he knew this. Jesus knew that, that this is something they'd all done before. Even they would have had a, enough compassion for a sheep to at least lift it out of the hole and set it, set it free. And so verse 12, how much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It is lawful. And then Mark's gospel, we read an additional statement where Jesus says, it is lawful on the Sabbath to do good, or excuse me, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to harm, to save a life or to kill? He puts it back on them. What do you guys think? Is it right to do good on the Sabbath? You can lift a sheep out of a, out of a hole in the ground. Can't you help somebody on the Sabbath? Can't you bless somebody on the Sabbath? See, their problem was is they were elevating law and ritual over the needs of the people. People are more important than practices. That's a principle even today. People are more important than practices. Again, why did Jesus create the Sabbath? For the good of his people. So they could cease from labor and glorify God and rest from work at least once a week. But to prohibit doing good on the Lord's Sabbath was wicked. It was wicked. Well, how do they respond? It's interesting. Matthew doesn't record the response, but Mark does. Mark records that in response to his question, they kept silent. Silent. They said nothing. Because they couldn't. They wouldn't even acknowledge the merit, the possibility of doing good on the Sabbath. They wouldn't even acknowledge that you could help somebody and heal them and minister to them and pick a piece of grain to feed them. A piece of grain from a grain field. You can't do that on the Sabbath and feed someone a meal? They said nothing. Mark 3, 5. And after looking around at them with anger, with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, Jesus decides to act. Verse 13. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored to normal like the other. Jesus heals this poor man on the Sabbath. And if you can read the white spaces in between all these verses here, bring in Mark, bring in Matthew. He's looking around at the Pharisees. He's angry at them. He's bubbling up with, with grief at the hardness of their heart. He looks on this poor man, this, this sheep who's been lost and, and hurting in this pit, if you will. And he says, for heaven's sakes, get this man out of the pit and heal him. Stretch out your hand and I'll heal you right now in their face. And that's what he does. In the presence of all, this Jesus man, this, he made this man whole again. You have to see there's a spiritual application here. Jesus made this man whole on the Sabbath. That would have been the best Sabbath of this man's life. What's the best day of your life? Always oh, a Sabbath, let me tell you. What happened? Jesus came and he made me whole. It's fitting that we see that Christ is restoring a person on the Sabbath because, again, that's what Sabbath is about. It's, it's where sinners find forgiveness and come to the Lord for rest. Didn't we read about that in Hebrews? That salvation is akin to finding rest in the Lord. We enter into His rest. Now, certainly that's a future heavenly reality. But don't we also find rest for our souls here and now? Isn't that what Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden and have withered hands and beaten up hearts and pain and suffering. All you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you lots of things to do, lots of labors, lots of work, lots of rules, rituals, observances. No, he says, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, the Lord's yoke does not consist of following laws and commands. We don't go backwards into Old Testament law to establish righteousness. 
That's a huge problem that's creeping into the church even today. I had someone ask me recently about I have a friend who is going back into to law keeping. He's going back to the Old Testament and trying to observe Old Testament law. And my answer to him was have him read Galatians. And he laughed at me. I said, no, tell him to read it twice. Because that's why Paul wrote that letter. Because Christians, New Testament believers, New Covenant believers, don't need to go back to law keeping for righteousness because there's no righteousness inherent in it for us. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our righteousness. It's on His merits. It's on His goodness and character and perfection and sinlessness. I've got nothing to offer the Lord in terms of merit. The Lord's yoke here, the law of Christ, is a law that is manifested in the heart. This does not mean we're antinomian, anti-law. It doesn't mean that you do whatever you want and have disregard for other people. Because Paul even says in Romans 13, 10, that we are to love our neighbor, to love other people, and therefore, in loving our neighbor, we do no wrong to him. When you love your neighbor, you don't violate law. In fact, love and compassion, he says, is the fulfillment of law. There's something greater than law at that point. You have the ministry of the Spirit working in your heart and through you to manifest true godly character. It does not mean, again, that we're lawless. But it means that a godly character will even go beyond the intent of law. Friends, we're not saved and sanctified through keeping the law. Again, our good works, the Bible says in Isaiah, is nothing except filthy rags to God. Rather, we're saved by God's mercy and grace toward us through faith in Christ. And then a person who has received grace, who has received mercy, and the love of God poured into them, and been forgiven of their trespasses and sins. And they've turned to God in repentance and say, Lord, forgive me, have mercy on me, a sinner. And received justification, a right standing with God, and adoption as sons. When we've received that, a thankful heart then pours forth all kinds of goodness that goes beyond law-keeping. It becomes the fruit of the Spirit as we see. Things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Those are the kinds of things that are pleasing to God. Not the sacrifices of the law, but the compassion and the love and the graciousness given to others in a way that we have received such grace. Well, how do the Pharisees respond to this? Because again, he's decimating their whole system in front of them. How do they respond? Do they bow the knee and say, you know what, Lord, you're right. You're right that we've actually been burdening people with our extra biblical laws, that we've oppressed people, we've hurt people, we've robbed widows' houses. We're wrong. Is that what they do? Verse 14. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him. as to how they might destroy him. The hardness of the human heart. And I know that there are times when I have it. And I know by the ministry of the Word to you, there are times when you have it. Where you just don't see. And you spurn God's grace. And you spurn His forgiveness. And you're insistent on creating your own righteousness. Why? Well, because doing that for me makes me look good and feel good and seem good. Versus humbling ourselves down and saying, Lord, forgive me. But the Pharisees, they didn't do it. They gathered together and in Mark's Gospel, it says they even went to the Herodians, their arch enemies. And their thinking was, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So I'm going to go and get every single religious leader I could possibly find. I don't care what their political position. I don't care the history. I don't care what kind of feuds we had in the families. We're going to go and we're going to get him. And we're going to destroy him. 
Jesus had been dismantling their entire workspace system. Law and legalism is so much easier than manifesting godly character. See, for the legalist, external righteousness provides a facade of holiness. But in reality, it's only dead religion. But in Christ, however, we are meant to find rest for our souls. We are meant to have our burdens eased. We're meant to come to Him as our shepherd and as our Lord because He truly is our Sabbath rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to You and our desire, Lord, is to come to You with a humble spirit. Our desire is to lower ourselves before You And yet, the Bible also tells us that those who come to you, you raise us up on eagles' wings. Lord, I can't fathom such kindness and such encouragement and such strength that even though we are dejected and lowly, and as we heard testimony even today of those who've gone through calamity and trial, when it feels like we're just being beaten up left and right, sometimes even by those who we love and those who love us, Lord, You are our Sabbath rest. You are the one who lifts us up and removes burdens. And You forgive sins. And by the ministry of the Spirit who has written our, Your law on our hearts, You cause us to walk in Your ways. You cause us to to love other people and to consider other people as more important than ourselves. You cause us to be kind and merciful to those who need You. Why? Because You, O God, have been merciful to us and showed us great mercy and kindness. And so, Lord, we pray. It's so easy for us, Lord. Forgive, forgive us. It's so easy to look at the Pharisees and say, that's them, versus cautioning our hearts, that might be me. So Lord, if there is, dare I say, a Pharisaical spirit within our own hearts, that you would expose it and help us to turn from that by faith and in trust. Help us, Lord. We are your sheep. We are your servants. We are, as the Bible tells us, your beloved. Thank you for the rest that you've given us in Christ. We pray all this in his name. Amen.